Hello, everybody. We continue our series on chess strategy deep dive. Remember, in the last episode, we were left with this position. That's a game of Vasily Smyslov with the black pieces. This was your homework. I hope you did your homework and I hope you understood that black is so much better here. Why? Because of all these weaknesses in the position. Just look at all these pawns, potential targets in the white camp. The white bishop is terrible right and the pieces are tied down so this is already giving black a big advantage but how do you proceed from here and here we are tying it to today's episode we'll talk about bad pieces good pieces and feeling for the pieces and that's exactly what smyslov did he looked at this knight this guy should improve but how can you find smyslov's move folks yes beautiful move h4 fixing the target on h3 and preparing knight h5, which will then put pressure on another weakness on f4. Simple and effective chess. In fact, white is no way to, pre to protect the position anymore. He tried to be active with rook b2, but it's still very difficult. Came knight h5, king f2, rook g3. Already it's impossible for white, right, to defend the weakness on f4, and things are collapsing. After rook b5, well, hitting the knight. Here's a beautiful question for you. Can we take the pawn on f4, folks? Can we take the pawn on f4? Blunder check, please. No. Because if you take on f4, right, this was white's sneaky point. And then he was going to capture your knight. So, Vasily Smyslov, of course, he sees this and does c5. And white, after rook b3, rook b3, knight f4, white resigned in his position because there is nothing to play for. The pawn has collapsed. The knight is improved. This is hanging. This is hanging. All the weaknesses remain in the position, and white has no counterplay at all. Resigns. So that's a beautiful conversion. This is the technical phase. I gave this position to you because it connected to previous episodes, right? We talked about weaknesses. We talked about, for example, fixing a weakness, exploiting a weakness. And this, now we are connecting, as I said, to pieces, right? How do we improve our pieces, badly placed pieces, and yet orient ourselves towards those targets, towards those weaknesses? Because this is how you play simple chess. This is how you play positional chess, folks. These are very fundamental lessons for you. Okay? So h4 is a very typical mechanism to fix a target. In this case, as I said, it's a multi-purpose move because it also allows knight h5. All right. So now I will continue with a couple of chess crimes. Big, big blunders, strategic blunders that are very instructive for us. Okay? In this position, black is down a pawn, but black has the bishop pair, and black does bishop b7. Beautiful, right? The bishop gets this beautiful open diagonal, and that bishop is an unopposed piece, so black surely has compensation, especially given white's weak pawn on d4 and so on, right? White goes rook c1, and my question is, what do you do with that weakness on c7 and against the threat on the pawn on e7? How do you defend that pawn? You have alternatives. Please avoid the chess crime. Folks, in the actual game, the chess crime c6 happened, and we say goodbye to this bishop. Black is voluntarily burying his own bishop for the sake of defending a single pawn. This bishop is now humiliated to a defensive post. This bishop has become a tall pawn, by the way, serves the function of just a single pawn, right? So we can't we can't play chess like this that's the big 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 chess crime 101 and um, in my project in the previous rating letter video this is also very common around 1000 chess.com rapid right people are letting down their pieces like that like there is no tomorrow and uh, they are making such strategic mistakes please avoid those because really 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 pieces are more important pawns are not people as jesse christ says and he's right in general, we should worry about our pieces rather than having this materialistic posture, especially in a case like this, right? No way. <laughs> no way that you play like this and bury your bishop. Okay? So, again, this episode, we'll talk about feeling for the pieces. In this case, the feeling for the pieces were missing for black. The best move is, of course, rook e7. You defend like this. Maybe you can double up rooks later, right? And you keep your bishop open. That's the most important thing, right? Okay. That's why I made a chessable course. There is chess crimes and punishment. It's full of such examples of crimes like C6 that we can learn tremendously. Because of, from an education psychology perspective, such learning from mistakes, other people's mistakes, 
uh, is a very effective learning tool, right? Because you see, you are changing your mental models, basically, by looking at uh, those mistakes. It allows us perfect opportunities to fix our mistakes, folks. Okay, one more chess crime is coming. Karokan defense, d4, d5, e5. At lower levels, you won't believe it. The move e6 is happening, okay? So this is just terrible. Black's feeling for the bishop is really, really bad because after e6, he's voluntarily locking down his own bishop, right? The bishop should go here and then you go e6, right? That's why you play the Karokan. You want to improve on the French defense, right? But the lower levels, chess.com, 1000, 1000, maybe 800. This is actually, uh, I mean, surprisingly common move. And again, th this move is played because people are lacking this basic feeling about their pieces, about their pieces, right? So this episode, we'll talk about pieces. What else? One more advanced example for you. Here, black goes a6. And please tell me, folks, what should the bishop do on b5? Please give yourself choices and tell me the most logical move. Okay, I think as a human, as a master, the most logical move is by far bishop b3. You have this advanced French pawn structure and the bishop really, really belongs on this diagonal. And of course, as you grow stronger, you have a better feeling of where the pieces belong, right? In which diagonal there they serve the best. But here I can explain this to you clearly because the bishop is unopposed in a diagonal. The bishop on b7 is terrible, right? And this a5 pawn is giving us chances for attacking on the king's side because they are not knight f6, for example, right? If black goes castle short, then the green keeps are coming, for example, right? The bishop is actually very, very nicely placed here. In the actual game, Around 1,000 chess.com person played bishop a4. And I think this is bad because the bishop is definitely doing nothing on that diagonal, right? The bishop is shooting on the wall of pawns, clearly badly placed, worse than on d3. Now the bishop needs to spend so much time. White needs to spend so much time, for example, bishop d2, you know, c3, and then bishop c2 to get the bishop to this ideal diagonal. It will cost white so much time, right? So again, before he does bishop a4, he should have seen this and he should have judged that the bishop has nothing, no business, sorry about the arrow, no business on that diagonal, right? So how do you train this? That's my question. How do we train this very basic ability of feel for our pieces? How do we speak to our pieces so we help them and so they can help, help us as well, right, in the future? Also, interestingly, psychological factors were also playing a role here. White, just a couple of moves ago, he went bishop b5 here. So after a6, he did not want to admit the mistake and went bishop b3. Because this, in his mind, was, oh, I'm admitting my previous mistake. I accept that bishop b5 was a mistake and now I have to retweet. I don't want to play chess like this. Right? That's why he refused this move. And then he went like this. That's so funny because he actually saw bishop b3. He felt that this was better for him, potentially but they refuse to play chess like that, right? Psychological factors, they are always playing role in chess, all right? So this is, of course, by the way, this, this mistake, you might say, is not as terrible chess crime as the previous ones, right? He's not voluntarily, let's say, burying his own bishop like that, but still, he's not giving himself a much better diagonal by pulling the bishop back to d3. Weaknesses and bad pieces and good pieces can affect our decisions in all aspects of the game. In this position, black has two choices. Please, folks, is it bishop d7 or bishop b7? Please stop the video and judge it for yourself. Congratulations if you found the move bishop d7, which is a much stronger move. Why? A couple of reasons. First of all, I'm hitting, I keep hitting your weak pawn on b5 and thus... I'm tying down your rook. This is the function, right, of we attacking a weak pawn because the enemy pieces must go passive. And that's an advantage for us, the attacking side. The second point is obviously I'm keeping the square for my king because I want to eventually, right, take over the a-file. That's a multi-purpose move. After rook a1, you tell me. Should we take the pawn or should we do something else? The opponent's last move. Which positional threat are we facing? Yes, this is the positional threat you're facing. That rook wants to invade the 7th rank. So, black should go. You tell me. King b7. Beautiful. Beautiful. This pawn is not going anywhere. That pawn is always going to be a long-term target. Thus, black achieves an advantage because rook 8s are coming. 
white must do something about the pawn. There is no rook a7 invasions, and black obtains an advantage, right? In the actual game, the black player played this. It's sort of a chess crime, right? Because the bishop really has nothing on that diagonal, and now there is no more pressure on the weak pawn on b5, and thus white can actually even do this, and there's no king b7, and now white can even think about, you know, getting the rooks on the a file like that. So it's a big turnaround, folks. It's a big turnaround. Just, you know, it looks like a simple, okay, well, I mean, so what? I have like two choices. What's the big deal? But it's a game changer. And for you to understand these things, of course, you need to look at the opponent's resources and ideas, but also very much so, right? Keep an eye on the weaknesses to tie down the enemy pieces. That's a basic message and lesson from this example, folks. Now, folks, having talked about all these things, weaknesses and pieces, I will show you a beautiful game and we will do it together. This game will consolidate what we have learned so far. And I, I love actually to form connections. I love to give you some positions that you can actually reach out to your previous knowledge that I told you, and you can actually try to consolidate, try to retrieve them from your memory. Okay? So, my first question is this. It's white to move. Can you identify a terrible piece in your camp? And can you try to improve it? And this is the secret sauce of playing good positional chess, identifying bad pieces and improving them, maneuvering your pieces to better pastures. Please give yourself some time. Look at the entire board, spot the weaknesses, pay attention to those, all these weaknesses in the position and bad pieces and try to form connections and make a plan, please. Folks, it's a beautiful game of young Alvest and he looks at his knight on b3. Congratulations if you saw this piece as a truly a terrible piece. This knight has nothing to do, right? On this square. Nothing. No business. Total domination of this knight. Then my question is, where should be the destination of this knight? What are we seeing as a potentially great square for the piece? Yes, I hope you also noticed this d5 outpost in the position. Oh my god. Now you form a plan. You want to improve a terrible piece to this beautiful outpost on d5. You connect Weaknesses and bad pieces right now, forming connections. So how do you do that? You tell me. Yes, he played knight a1. An amazingly beautiful retreat. His whole point is, of course, is to transfer the knight to this beautiful d5 outpost. Incredible. Simple chess, in fact. There is nothing complex about that. He asks himself very simple questions and thus find the idea. Black is fighting because if black waits, right? If black doesn't play like this, then white will achieve the goal. So black must do something. He does f5. And now white is using some tactics. In this position, by the way, e takes f5 was also quite, quite good for white. You can also play like this. But it's a more tactical line, actually. Look at this. You need to find queen takes d6. And then this move. And then white is actually winning. But white doesn't want to go here, yeah? But I mean, the line goes on, of course. But then, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a quite a complex, quite a complex line. But white is winning here. So after f5, white simply plays positional chess. Does knight 3 Black goes e4, f4. If in this position black takes on e4, by the way, I will show you the main point because it looks like white's losing a pawn, right? So what? And then comes this beautiful tactical shot. Knight g4. Well, the threat is huge, right? Knight 96. Check is coming now. And also you're opening up the rook against the bishop. So black is losing material by force. Check this out. Knight f6 and white wins, right? So this beautiful knight, knight e3 move is really great because tactics are serving white in this position. He's using tactics to improve the piece. And now the knight, of course, reaches this beautiful destination. Check this out, folks. Of course, if you take my knight, then the game is over, right? If you take this knight, it's a double attack. Bam, right? The knight is hanging, the rook is hanging, and white wins. And the beast arrived on d5. So, so the first phase of the operation is complete, right? You got this terrible knight on b3, and you moved it all the way to d5. And black has just played knight h5. And now comes my second question to you. Please look at the board and formulate a good plan for white folks. What should white do in this position? Weaknesses. That's my little support for you. Little scaffold. This question is, is something that you learned before. I talked about this in my previous videos. Give yourself some time. Look at the entire board. The idea... My final hint is to create a weakness. Can you create a weakness 
in Black's camp. Congratulations, folks. If you found the move A4, the minority attack is waging. One pawn versus two pawns. White Mountain simply create a target on the queen side. Now, A5 is coming, and either the pawn on A5 will be weak, or the pawn on B6, or my rook will keep attacking you on the B file. It's a beautiful way to create more targets. Right? So, here I gave you this game because it features beautifully, right? Feeling for the pieces and also creating a target minority attack. So, that's why this position is here, folks. We are consolidating our memories. In the initial game, Black actually fought well. He take on A5. And yet, of course, now White has clear targets on the Queen side. But actually, Black played a very, very nice game. He's fighting very, very well. Rook A5, Knight C6, good move. And now the Black's claim is this. Yes, you get yourself a big pawn on A7, but that's also a passed pawn. So Black now wants to, let's say, make use of that passed pawn in the position. Right? But White says that pawn is not dangerous at all. So I will put more pressure and you will suffer. If you ask the engine, it's around equal here. But I think objectively, maybe practically, it's just easier to play with white, this position. I mean, black is a bishop pair. The rooks are actually targeting that pawn. So black needs to be careful to hold this position. Taking on d5 is never good for, for black because it improves my structure. It also opens up my bishop on e2, right? So black is sort of waiting in this position and white gradually improves. So here white decides to take on f6. Followed by rook p6. Nice move, right? Weakness awareness. White improves every single piece. And here, black goes wrong. The only move that holds balance is rook e6 for black. He must have played this, but that's also, you know, the pieces are tied down. Instead, he does knight f7. And can you stop the video and find a small little tactic for white? I think everyone can see it right now. Yes. Bishop c5. The pawn is pinned. And white just won a clear pawn. Here comes the second pawn, and after c5, black resigned in this position. It's a beautiful game, folks. Don't you think? If you go back to the very beginning, I mean, this is the secret source of positional chess, right? Weakness awareness, which piece is bad, and can I improve them? Can I combine these things? Once you, once you ask yourself these questions, you can find this, these moves. Here, nice, yeah? Tactics serving strategy. He's achieving a strategic goal by using tactics. And here comes the second phase. Right, second phase of the positional plan. I'm looking at the board. Well, I have no clear targets. So which pawn can I attack right now? I mean, what should my rooks do, for example? I don't see clear targets for my pieces. So I need to create one. Can I create a weakness? Yes, you can. Look at the minority attack, right? A4, A5 is coming. And white achieves good pieces. White achieves a plan. White finds those targets, put, put pressure, gradually improve every single piece, and then win the game like that. It's really, really beautiful strategic masterpiece for the white pieces. That's why it's here in this segment, folks. And this position is your homework until the next episode, folks. This also connects to what we've seen before. It's white to play. It's a beautiful game of Anatoly Karpov. White to play. Can you formulate a plan for white in this position by asking yourself the questions we just investigated in this episode? This will be a nice homework for you to consolidate you are newly acquired knowledge. Thank you so much, and I will catch you in the next episode. Bye-bye.